This is the best village trading setup in Minecraft, with features like 3.2 second void trading cycles, variable emerald supply, encoded villager selection, minimal server impact, and persistent wandering traders, allowing you to trade for things like these infinitely. In this video, I'll explain how it works and how you can build and use it, so be sure to stick around because you won't want to miss this. Hello everyone, my name's MD, and welcome back to another video. If you've been in the technical side of Minecraft for a while, you may have heard of void trading, the method of trading with a villager that isn't loaded by the game that prevents trades from locking out. It was discovered by Cubic Meter and Dr. Rush of the Hammer SMP, and is usually done by teleporting the player far away using an end gateway. This allows the player to unload the area while keeping the trade window open and then making the trade. Because of this, while the trade happens, the game cannot save the related data such as the trade being locked to the villager as it isn't even loaded. This process can be done repeatedly and allows players to never be locked out of a trade and thus trade infinitely. Now you can agree that's pretty impressive and very powerful, but it's not perfect. Void trading has its drawbacks. The first one being it usually limits you to the end dimension. This is because end gateways are the only way to quickly move a player in the same dimension. There have been alternatives like Ray Lines by ENX04 or Pulse Traces Chambers by Nico is Lost, but none of them could compare to the speed and simplicity of a gateway. The second drawback is that it gets very taxing on the server. The repeated loading and unloading of large areas of the world as you go back and forth to and from the villager puts a lot of strain on both the client and the server. Thirdly, in the upcoming 1.21 update, gateways will change so that they now load chunks around them when an entity goes through just like nether portals. This is a massive nerf to classic void trading as it now means a normal trade cycle is a minimum of 15 seconds long since you have to wait for the chunk loading to end. Finally, while void trading can be done with wandering traders, you can only make a limited amount of trades before the trader is lost, since they despawn after being loaded for 40 minutes. That last point is actually quite underrated. For most people, wandering traders are just an annoyance and provide no value. But they actually have some very interesting trades, which are usually ignored because they are so limited. Stuff like sand, red sand, coral blocks, small drip leaf, nautilus shells, packed in blue eyes, which can be very useful. So then with void trading so established and developed for years, what changed? To understand the new method, we first have to understand how the game processes the world. Minecraft loads parts of the world in 16 by 384 by 16 columns of blocks called chunks, which you can see by enabling chunk borders with F3 plus G. Depending on your render distance, a certain range of chunks around a player will be loaded by the game, but not all chunks are loaded the same. The ones you normally encounter are called entity processing chunks. Everything works here including entities and redstone. These chunks usually form a rather large area around the player, but surrounding that area is a ring of chunks called the lazy chunks or redstone processing chunks. In these chunks, entity processing is paused and they appear to be frozen but redstone components still work as normal. It's important to note that while entities and lazy chunks don't move by themselves, you can still move them with pistons. There is another ring of chunks around lazy chunks called the border chunks, in which neither entities nor redstone gets processed, but are still visible and loaded into memory. With that knowledge, we can now take a look at a very interesting and niche mechanic called lazy linking. First discovered by Bread of the Kronos SMP, Lazy linking refers to desyncing of a passenger entity from the vehicle it was riding. The way it's done is by pushing the passenger alone while the vehicle itself is in a lazy or border chunk. What happens is since the vehicle cannot tick, it is unable to update the position of its passenger to be above it. So you end up with a frozen passenger that cannot move since it's technically still riding the vehicle entity. But you can move that passenger anywhere unless that vehicle is entity loaded or fully unloaded. This can be used for a couple of things, the famous one being the world border cannons that many creators have showcased. If you want to learn more about lazy linking, I've linked a video in the description by Comedy that goes over it in more detail. Now you may be thinking, okay, lazy linking is interesting, but how does something used for big cannons help with trading? That question can be answered by Meng Meng, a Billy Billy creator who combined player movement, lazy linking, and an instant entity conveyor to create the world's first ever lazy trader. Let's break down how it works. The contraption has three main sections, the player end, the conveyor, and the villager end. In its default state, it has a player standing at the edge of a chunk border, 
such that the villager end of the conveyor is in a border chunk and the actual villager is right on the edge of the next chunk not loaded by the game. When the machine is triggered, it moves the player across the border, which is just enough to lazy load the end of the conveyor, and since it can now process redstone, it uses a piston to extend into the next chunk, where the villager in a minecart now lies in a border loaded chunk. The villager is pulled into the lazy chunk, and the instant entity conveyor fires, bringing the villager to the player. The player then opens the villager's trading UI, and is pulled back to the starting chunk. This unloads the chunk containing the villager's minecart, which unloads the villager. It is at this point that the player can make the trade, and then the process can repeat. The great thing about such a setup is that the villager is never actually processed by the game, since it is either unloaded or in a border chunk. So if this villager was a wandering trader, you could trade forever without the trader ever despawning. But this particular setup has a pretty big issue. It can handle only one villager. If you want to lazy trade with another villager, you have to manually swap it in, which isn't great for obvious reasons. For a trading setup to be practical, you need some way to automatically swap villagers in and out while having the chunks loaded for the least amount of time possible. That's exactly what my friend and fellow Noob Tech member Manman25 set out to do. Over the course of a few months, Manman developed this, the main focus of this video and one of the most powerful trading halls ever made, which he has named the Lazy Overworld Villager Exchanger, or Love for short. That name might sound stupid to a lot of you. But if you're familiar with my last project, it's not the worst one you've heard, is it? The love is made of six main components. The trading station, villager matrix, villager stalker, wandering trader farm, box loader, and emerald resupplier. So let's explore all that this build has to offer, starting with the villager matrix. The villager matrix is where all the villagers and wandering traders are stored. It is set up in such a way that a villager in a cell can be moved to the trading position and also be sent back into place by providing the matrix with a set of redstone signals that encode the information in signal strengths which are transmitted by an instant comparator line from the control room. The matrix itself uses cells adapted from Inspector Talon's encoded trading hall to store the villagers in 5 rows of 15 cells each, which makes calling villagers very easy. But there's a problem. The matrix is so far away from the player that it's never loaded normally. So then how do we load it for villager switching? The solution is simple. When any villager is called or returned, the first four rows of the matrix are chunk loaded by the two portal chunk loaders on top. We only do the first four rows and not the last row, since that is reserved for wandering traders, and the system will only load those if a wandering trader is processed. Trading only happens with one villager at a time, and that villager is sent from the matrix. But what happens if you mess up and send another villager without returning the first one? Lucky for you, Man Man added some safety mechanisms. When a villager or trader is called, the system first checks to see if a villager is in the trading slot, and if so, returns it to its cell inside the matrix automatically. Once the old villager is put back, only then is the new villager or trader called to the trading slot. There's also a reservation for the event of an accidental loading of the trading villager while in use, which could cause the trade to lock out. The villager matrix can be manually chunk loaded using a lever in the control room to allow any villager trades to restock but this wouldn't be needed under normal use. Now what about our special boys, the wandering traders? To stock the matrix, the player must first manually open the cells to receive traders by tuning the cell's node block. They can also close the cell by clicking the node block above. The love comes with an attached wandering trader spawning platform above the main control room. Once any cells to receive a trader have been opened, the player can AFK in the middle of the platform. Wandering traders spawn in a square 48 block radius from a random online player and as long as the player is on the platform, the traders will walk to the player and fall in a hole, detaching them from their llamas and taking them through the nether to the wandering trader's cells. If the player is not present on the AFK platform, the drop shoot is locked out and the wandering trader will not be able to access the nether portal, preventing wandering traders from being stalked at a bad time. There's also a simple counter on the AFK platform to let the player know how many wandering traders have been captured. We'll discuss the trading process a little later, but for now, let's see what happens to the items you've traded. After a trade cycle, the player drops the items into a water stream that run by three of Acacia Chan's 6x hopper speed mixed box loaders. When filled, the boxed items get transported to the output chests in the control room. If you don't trade for entire boxes of items, you can also manually eject the partially filled boxes with the press of this button in the trading station. 
Before they get stored, the dropped items also trigger a tripwire that lets the system know that the trade has succeeded, which is how the emerald resupplier knows when to drop emeralds. Speaking of which, the emerald resupplier is a system that automatically dispenses a customized amount of emeralds every trade cycle. It uses 16 double speed shulker box unloaders to unload up to 255 items in 64 game ticks, which becomes the optimal trade cycle time. The first pulse can drop between 1 and 15 emeralds, then if more are needed, all the unloaders can fire up to 15 times to drop up to 240 emeralds in multiples of 16. In the unlikely event that you have some very expensive book trades and you need more than 255 emeralds at a time, a combination of a box and cart eater can provide batches of 4 stacks of emeralds. This adds an additional 256 emeralds to the total available for resupply each cycle. Along with the emeralds, you can also request 12 books to be dropped each cycle. So then how do you even use this thing? You as the player will spend most of your time in this, the control slash trading room. On the right side is everything related to the matrix. These 5 lecterns are how you select the villager or wandering trader from their respective rows in the matrix. You choose the villager by finding its page in the book, then you press the button above the lectern to confirm your choice and call the villager, and the system handles the rest. The button to return the villager is also here, along with the lever that controls the chunk loading override. On the other side of the room lies the output for traded items, along with the force eject button. Adjacent to that are the inputs for emeralds, books, and shulker boxes that the system stocks. Finally, there are the controls for the emerald resupply. Like the matrix, it is lectern based, but in this case you have one for fine control and one for bigger batches. As an example, if you have a trade for 5 emeralds and can trade a maximum of 12 times a cycle, you need 60 emeralds per cycle. The way you input this is to take the closest lower multiple of 16, in this case 48, and put it in the batch control. The remaining amount, which is 12, is what you put in the fine control and then enable both these drops. Now every trade cycle, the system will dispense 60 emeralds to you. That last lever just adds 256 emeralds to the batch like we discussed earlier, but it's rare that you'd ever use it. Finally, in the corner you'll find the box display for emeralds that you take the starting amount to trade with from. The only thing left is the trading station itself. It has some indicator lights above it, but those are pretty self-explanatory. The trading process itself is quite simple. When you have selected the villager you wish to trade with, and have put the appropriate amount of emeralds to refill, you get into the minecart and aim for the top right corner of the node block. To initiate the cycle, you right click the node block which will start by pushing you forward to load the conveyor end, and moments later the conveyor will trigger and the villager will appear in front of you. If you are holding down right click, you will automatically click into the villager GUI, and after a short delay, you will get pulled back and the villager disappears since it is unloaded. It is at this point that you can make the chosen trade or multiple different trades. Then to both send the items to storage as well as refill your emeralds, you can drop the trade results in the same direction you are facing to send them to collection. You can click the node block and repeat the steps to continue the cycle. Once you are done, you can send the villager back to its cell with this button. Since this process is quite interaction heavy, it's a little tricky to automate, but there is a way to do it. Using a custom essential client script, it's possible to go completely hands-free with the trading and let the game run in the background while you do other things. Once you have the mod on your client, install the script in the scripts folder under configs. Then in the game, you open up the trade script config with the default key of n. It is here where you can customize the script for the items you wish to trade, then get into position and run the script with the hotkey you set. If you have pause on lost focus disabled, you can tap out of the game while the script runs. After all that explanation, you'll probably want to know how you can get your hands on the log. Unlike my other videos, I will not be making a block by block tutorial as that would take forever. Instead, in the description you'll find a link to a world download that has all the information you will need to build it. Usage of the Lightmatica mod is highly recommended for help building in survival. Some important things to note with the world download though. The provided build works with a view and simulation distance of 10. Both render and simulation distance must always be the same to give you one ring of lazy chunks and one ring of border chunks. If your server does not run a distance of 10, you can modify the love to fit your render distance by tiling sections of the conveyor. The conveyor sections are 16 blocks long, which makes it very easy to expand as needed. 
it is recommended to use mods like World Edit or Axiom for this process. Also before you ask, the love was designed for use on vanilla or fabric servers. There's no guarantee it'll work on other server softwares like Paper, Purple, Spigot or likewise and it definitely does not work on Bedrock Edition. So please don't spam my comments. But that's all I have for you today. Before we wrap it up, I want to give a massive thank you to Madman25 for allowing me to make this video and for all his help in the production. I couldn't have done it without him. If you have any questions for us, you can find us on the Nuke Tech Discord server linked below. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next one.